Okay, I suggest we get started. Um, a very good morning to you all and uh, thank you for attending this uh, Enterprise Ireland uh, Eurozone webinar on the future of the aviation industry in, in Europe. So my name is uh, Patrick Torkins and I'm a member of the um, Eurozone management team based in, in Paris and I'll be your host uh, for this session and I'll do my best uh, to make it as, as insightful and entertaining as possible. So the seminar will, will consist of a presentation part from one of the key stakeholders in the aviation industry, Eurocontrol, followed by an interactive session with you, with you, the audience. So we have a good mix of uh, participants today uh, with Enterprise Ireland clients from a wide variety of, of sectors in manufacturing, services, uh, digital and, and other sectors. So um, we would very much welcome interaction with you. Um, however, we would ask you to save your questions till after the presentation and you can drop them in the question box and we will invite you then to ask your, your question later on. We would also like to ask you to keep your microphones on mute so that there is no uh, interference uh, during uh, the presentation. So we have a 45 uh, minutes for this session and at least 15 minutes will really be dedicated uh, to the Q&A session. So this session will, will really address questions such as how will Europe accelerate the recovery of the aviation industry uh, post-COVID? What solutions can, can Irish companies bring and what will the industry look like uh, post uh, COVID-19. So it's really high time to um, introduce uh, the speaker for this event and we're extremely pleased that Eamon Brennan, Director General of Eurocontrol, could free up his busy schedule to interact with us today. Mr. Brennan was appointed by 41 member states of Eurocontrol to lead the organization on January the 1st, 2018 and Eurocontrol, Eurocontrol, as most of you will know, is the pan-European organization dedicated to supporting European aviation. So Eurocontrol strives to make aviation in Europe safer, more efficient, more cost-effective and with a minimal environmental impact. Prior to joining Eurocontrol, uh, Eamon was the chief executive of the Irish Aviation Authority where he was responsible for the provision of air traffic management services in Irish controlled aerospace, aeronautical communications on the North Atlantic and air traffic control at the major Irish airports, as well as the safety and security regulation of the Irish civil aviation industry. Eamon has held many leading roles in the air traffic uh, management industry and summarizing his profile, we can say we are very lucky to have a speaker who brings 35 years of working experience across three continents in over 25 countries in both the public and the private sector. Eamon has played a crucial role in the development of aviation policy, both in Ireland and abroad, and has keenly supported the implementation of the single European Sky program closely working with the European Union and other European institutions. So, Eamon, we're very glad to have you and I gladly hand over the platform to you. Good morning, Patrick, and good morning from Brussels. I hope that everybody is well. So, um, I'll try and make this morning as interesting as I can. So, if you can stay with me for about 20 minutes, I'll, I'll outline to you what the, the, the main items are. So, first of all, I think, Patrick, it's just worthwhile giving a kind of a short introduction to what Eurocontrol does. We're a, a, a large organization, that, but our main facets are basically we provide the air traffic network management for Europe. So, normally, we would handle about 11 million flights uh, a, a year. Um, so, if you travel from any country in Europe, we control the system known as the slot system and also um, transits for any country. We also handle all the financing of the system. It's about 10 billion per annum is the cost of running the European air traffic control. We also actually provide air traffic uh, services. We're the fifth largest air traffic service provider in Europe over northern Germany, uh, the Netherlands and, and the Benelux country. But interestingly enough, we're a civil military organization and we also do a huge amount of work for the um, European Union. 
But it's important to realise we're not part of the European Union. We have 42 member states, 41 member states. And what's really interesting from an Irish perspective is that the United Kingdom remain members of Euro control, even though they leave the United the um, uh, the single European uh, or the, sorry, they leave the European Union. So there's a huge amount of bodies in in um, Europe that deal with aviation, including the safety regulator. Many of your members will be familiar with um, EASA. We're probably the largest of the organisations central to everything, and we actually work very closely with all of the organisations ranging from defence. It also might be interesting for your for for everybody on the panel to say, look, who pays for everything in Europe? Well, unlike the United States, we have a system in Europe of route charges, and route charges is collected from every airline, and they pay for everything that deals with aviation. So if you look at last year, the year before we had the crash. The largest carrier in Europe pays the most, 692 million from Ryanair. Remember, the total figure is 10 billion, but basically it reflects the traffic loads there, Ryanair, EasyJet, you know. And what's interesting, if you looked at this 10 years ago, it would have been dominated by the British Airways, the Air France's, all of this. Now you see airlines like Voiling, Qatar, Emirates, a complete change in the picture in Europe. So quickly, you know, if we look at what happens there uh, because of the fact we've had COVID? If you look, for instance, at Ireland, you would normally have uh, collected probably about 100 million at this stage for overflight fees, and you have 37 million. So it's a significant deterioration. But let's look at COVID. So COVID really is something that you know none of us anticipated. I think all of your executives will probably sympathise with me when I say that I signed off on a. a um, a risk analysis for Europe and European aviation in the early part of January, and nowhere in it did it say pandemic. So it's like 10 times the volcanic ash crisis coming on us at the one time. We're facing a wave of lockdowns, they're returning, you know, and we're looking at really significant losses in the aviation market. Well, what's interesting is yesterday I spoke with IATA, all the profit they made for the past five to seven years will be wiped out by the losses that they make this year. So it's really significant. China starting to return. Interestingly, there were over 12,000 flights in China yesterday. Normally there would be 14. So they've come right back up domestically. And they've even resumed manufacturing of the Airbus A320 in China. So they're really back on normal track. Their international services, however, are still very, very low. So it's very tricky. I think this is an interesting one. It's a kind of a spaghetti chart. But what's really interesting on this is I want to just show you this. Look at Europe. And Europe is the blue line there. We are the only continent at the moment where the trend is significantly continuing down. Even the United States with coronavirus, Latin America, the trend for the last number of months has resumed growth. But Europe is trending down again with the second wave. And this is basically because of the quarantine situation and all of this. Maybe I could just mention that, you know, like when you look at the situation in Europe, there's 140 billion of lost revenue. Now, this is really bad for business and it's really bad for everybody looking on today because it means everybody from airlines, you know, MROs, OEMs, everybody is going to have difficulty with cash nobody's going to want to actually do anything and nobody's going to want to spend. The general theme running through the industry at the moment is to slow everything down, conserve cash. And I'm seeing this ranging right through the system um, from people who actually make engine nacelles to people who are providing MRO services. It's all the same everywhere. And it's a complete disaster, to be honest. So looking at the um, last number of months, when this crisis started, the problem that we foresaw at the time was that people would be afraid to travel on aircraft. Actually, that's probably not the case anymore because we published uh, with the ASA an aviation health safety protocol and also with ICAO. Both of this worked very well, no major problems there. The real issue is the state restrictions. And in Europe at the moment, we have a quarantine uh, reaction nearly everywhere. We don't have common testing. Uh, basically, we don't currently have a common European response. Now, the Council did meet last week, and I'll discuss that at the moment. But the reality is, is that the public, and this is something completely different than the 2008 economic crisis that went on. It's completely different than 
here we have a situation where we don't have a recession caused by normal factors. We have a recession caused by a pandemic. And I would expect that there would be a reasonably quick pullout of this in the event that we actually got a vaccine. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment. But the real reality is there's no public confidence to book. So last week, the EU Council adopted measures concerning COVID-19 travel responses. I mean, if you look at this in Ireland, most of the um, countries in Europe were using this system all throughout the summer. And if you consider the situation in Ireland, um, you know, we didn't open up travel in Ireland really at all. You know, load factors in out of Ireland were maybe 14, 15 percent. They were very poor. And um, this is coming from both Reiner and Erlingus. But also, you know, you opened the public houses very late. You opened everything late. You actually, actually also um, restricted travel. And the reality is, is that you're in no better situation today than everybody who allowed travel, such as Germany, Italy, Spain. They're in the same situation as you are today. So some of this, I would say, is kind of from an aviation point of view, is questionable. Now, I'm biased. I'll be honest. I'm an aviation advocate. But if we look at what we agreed last week in Europe, we agreed a very important thing. We agreed that we would publish a common map. Now, currently, the map is red. And if you look really at the moment, unless you want to travel from the south of Italy, and this is uh, last, this week's one, to, to Norway, uh, really you can't go anywhere without having some kind of a quarantine situation. But what I would be saying to Ireland, and it's important, is adopt this, have the restrictions now, but when countries turn green, do it. And that's the difference between Ireland and the others. When the countries turn green in Europe, the other countries allow travel. When they turn green in Ireland, they don't allow travel, they delay. And I put it to you that the success rate with the COVID is actually no higher than Germany. In fact, it's worse, or some of the other countries in Europe. And this is the reality of, of the COVID for aviation. As an island nation, nowhere is more dependent on aviation. And sometimes the response is probably difficult to comprehend when you're in Europe. You know, it's really important that the message uh, gets out very strongly. I mean, we have here, for instance, you know, the situation with the um, with Boeing and with Airbus, and these are studies that were completed in the last week. But yet, when you pick up the newspapers in Ireland, none of this comes out. What you see is that it's dangerous to travel. The reality is, you are much safer in an aircraft than you are in a supermarket. You're much safer in an aircraft uh, than you are in nearly any social situation because the air is moved all the time, it's filtered, and you get the cabin air fully renewed at least once every two to three minutes. And the same study was carried out independently by, by Boeing. And you can see, for instance, that you know you effectively, because of the moving of cabin air, you effectively get a seven-foot social distance between passengers on airlines. But anyways, all of this is wishful thinking from my point of view, because the reality is much worse. The reality is, that during the summer, we regained ground. The big thing that tipped it was when the United Kingdom changed the rules with Spain. People had gone to Spain on holidays, Spain was a green zone, and then they suddenly unilaterally changed it around. This was very difficult. So if you look at the last seven days in Europe alone, we're 57% reduction in flights from the same time last year. And here's something really interesting, that since uh, the same day, the 20th of October last year, 61% reduction. The situation is actually getting worse. The same day last year, we did 31,500 flights approximately. And you can see there that we did 12,200 this year. This is a real big problem. But look, how is it affecting the airlines? So if you look at the large European carriers, and here I'm looking at the 20th of October, and these are live flights from our network management system here in Eurocontrol. The largest airline in Europe is Ryanair, 600 flights, 60% reduction in the in in the last week. You know, and that's all since the, to, you're comparing with 2019. But here's an interesting thing: Aer Lingus are 27th, only operating 35 flights, and the load factors generally throughout the system are 40%. You all know that the break-even load factor on an A320 approximates 71%. So really, it's the same on a 738. The reality is nobody's making money at the moment. And actually, this cutback, we believe, may, may accelerate further. But here's a point to you. Look at this very carefully. Where is EasyJet? EasyJet would normally be number two, operating 1,600 flights a day. 
they basically have cut operations back, scaled back significantly, now only operating about 150 to 200, peaking some days, moving other days, and basically you're seeing a ghost schedule, and they don't envisage resuming significant operations again until uh, Easter. But this is wider than Europe, and this is going to have a big effect on, on your, your ability to generate markets over the next number of years. For instance, the United States, North America, is approximately 70% down. So what was operating on the 22nd of the 10th, was, or the 20th of the 10th, was basically 68% reduction, uh, and the other 15% was largely cargo, and then business jets, and a number of military operations. Point-to-point -point operations and hub-and-spoke operations have totally stopped. And this has an effect on the European network as well, because the European network, you know, is dependent on hub and spoke. So you see airlines like KLM, British Airways, you know, ILG operations and Lufthansa are stopping hubbing and spoking because there is no long haul travel. Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas, told me they will not be resuming intercontinental operations till a minimum of Easter of next year. And in fact, the Australian minister poured damp water on that and said that it might even be 2022. So this is a very difficult situation for the industry. Unprecedented, we've never seen it before. At the airports, it's even worse. If you look at the situation with Dublin, you know, a 75% reduction over 2019. And basically in Europe, you know, airlines are getting 40% load factor. That's translating to the disaster that's happening at the airport. So each airports are approximately down 80%. And as you know, there's huge fixed costs. So maybe I turn to the future. So when we are looking at where we see the scenarios going, we've been alarmingly accurate because we work very closely. We have weekly conference calls with the CEOs of airlines. And since April, our prediction has been pretty right. The black line, and we, we initially envisaged it going along the blue line, but we revised it to the red line there. Um, basically in the middle of September. However, because of the current restrictions, we expect a further downward revision. So in reality, we're expecting that by November, we instead of being down about 58%, we could actually be down 75%. It's not looking good at all. And it's basically very much a shadow um, operation. So this is, is significantly di difficult because when you see this, the straight effect of this is airlines don't have cash. And if airlines don't have cash, they're not contracting MROs, they're not actually buying new equipment and they're delaying uh, deliveries. So I want to just look at the impact on aerospace and particularly on your, on your industry. So, you know, we know the current situation is pretty bleak, but the reality is, in, and the unfortunate reality, is that some of the stuff that you're doing in aerospace is easy enough to defer in the very short term. Not in the long term, it's easy to defer in the short term. So currently in 2020, they're saying that the global aerospace industry would be down 14%. Actually, I think this is a gross um, underestimation. I believe actually that's nearer 35 or 40%. And I'll tell you why in a, in a moment. We've, we have very close contact with Airbus. So if you look, for instance, at a 40% production cut for the next two, two years, that's a lot. Now, look at the effect that has on the value chain. People like Saffron who are producing nacelles, you know, people like um, CFM who are producing engines. This, this is a huge value chain reduction, ranging from people who make carpets right through to the avionics. And the same with Boeing. And you can see, for instance, that look, they're gonna turn out 240 aircraft this year versus 750. And you know, if you go back two years ago, they were producing 1200. And this is huge reduction. For Boeing. And then, of course, we have the MAX problem, and at least we see some light at the end of the tunnel there. But let's be, let's be clear, and I want you to have a close look, look at this. The, su su the supply chain is in a shock situation at the moment. You know what, ma what manufacturers do? They always try to pass the problem down, down to the subcontractors. So if you're selling you know, software or maintenance services at the moment, you've got some difficulty, and this is a big problem. So if we look at the global fleet projections, and we've broken this down very carefully, we've talked to General Electric about this, to Boeing and to, to Airbus, but just have a look at the way it was. You can see that it's significantly reduced in March, April, and May, you know, 
But the big point I want to say to you is that it will be 2024 before we get back to the 2019 levels. That's a minimum. And realistically, next year, 2021, is going to be basically the same as October of this year, nothing significantly more. We don't see a vaccine actually coming live until um, the last quarter of 2021. Yes, there might be a vaccine, but as to whether or not it will be available. But this figure is pretty dismal because it shows that, you know, we're facing a period of stagnation. So for everybody, it's about survival mode for the next year. You know, when we look at the MROs and particularly, you know, the maintenance organizations, you can see, for instance, that there's significant cutback in what I call line maintenance operations. And this is basically reflecting the loss of flights, but also components. You know, what I've been told by airlines is their first move when they get flying again will be to run down their stock. They won't be ordering new stuff. And um, remember that other than the essential, um, you know, checks for flying, et cetera, that you need to put an aircraft back into service, we're not keeping the value chain going. And what I mean by that is the MRO value chain is very much based on flight hours. So if you have engine flight hours, airframe flight hours, and at the moment with so much reduced flight hours and no intercontinental operations of any sort, you can see that the the availability of um, maintenance operations for engines, airframes and components, we believe will be quite limited next year. So you're going to see a significant reduction of about 40% next year, but it will come back. So I think it's important for Irish manufacturers to maintain the capacity to keep doing it. And I think that this is very, is very important. So what, what's important to look at really is what's pluses and what minuses. I expect to see further airline bankruptcies this winter. There's no doubt about it. The result of this will be a consolidation of the industry. You know, you've had bailouts for Lufthansa, bailouts for Air France, bailouts, um, you know, for Alitalia. I mean, to me, it's the, you know, the wonder of the world how Alitalia still exists after all these years. But generally, you're seeing order cancellations. Airbus told us in a conference call that most, supply, most people are now seeking to put 2021 deliveries into Q4 2022. Don't want to take the aircraft. Um, so you're looking at basically you know, a problem. And then you have, of course, the changed behaviors, environment and telework. I'm not as negative about this. I think people will return to travel once it be, they get the idea that it's safe. And I think there'll be a little bit of pent up demand. But in the short term, I'm pessimistic. So the growth opportunities, I believe, for Ireland have to be embracing one thing. And I would urgently ask you to look at decarbonisation solutions in terms of research, looking at hydrogen electrification, but also looking at lightweight components and all of this kind of stuff. It's all you can do. Commercial drones will, of course, they've taken a little hit at the moment. But I think by 2025, I think you might see a reasonably good market developing in Europe for commercial drones and emerging economies. One thing I want to say to you is the best place to recover at the moment is Asia. And I think that it will recover significantly faster than we would. So I think in Europe, it's going to be stagnant for 2021. But I believe that your opportunity has to be Southeast Asia, particularly China, and looking at those markets. I mean, if you look at the demographics there alone, there are the obvious places to go. And also technology advances. You know, I was very sorry to see the A380 and the 747 phased out. But look, guys, this was going to happen. Hub and spokes operations, to me, never really added up because even from a decarbonisation point of view, they're very, very difficult. Point to point operations with um, 787s and A350s, I believe, are the solution. It's really good time to invest in staff because training, I noticed Conor McCarthy in um, Dublin Aerospace has taken on apprentices and this is really important as well. These take four or five years to come up. So there are opportunities in things like landing gear, overhaul, you know, checks that need to be done. But the reality is because the fleet's not moving, it's not generating demand. So the only real short-term opportunity I believe is to drop prices a little, offer the airlines maybe advance um, servicing on some parts and some checks if that's possible and see what you can do. But my discussions with airline CEOs is they have one common theme. They want to keep all the cash in the airline. So they will do anything to preserve cash. And I think this is the challenge that you're facing in Irish aviation. 
for us in, in Europe, we have tried to help airlines. The user charges that we normally charge, we deferred 1.1 billion of them. You know, we've also given loans to the air navigation service providers and states from Europe, and we've actually pumping cash into the system. So it's remember, we're not responding in Europe to the recession the same way that we did in 2008. We've not cut back, we're actually pumping cash in. And we're using the expression that they use in Italy, Italy, helicopter money. You can see it in the Irish economy, where, for instance, they're pumping in the um, COVID payments. And, you know, I think that it's very conservative in Ireland at the moment, the, react, the, the way that you're approaching the COVID situation. And I hope it works out very well. Um, and we'll see again. But the danger is that you end in a kind of a yo-yo cycle where you're in and out of restrictions all the time. And if that happens, then you're going to be in problems. Uh, as an antidote, somebody told me once that um, the people who are taking this, the decisions, you know, should always be impacted by them. And that's a general principle of management worldwide. And that, I think, is sometimes that gets missing in the political system. But generally, uh, in Europe, you know, we're, we're publishing business continuity plans every single week. We, we publish uh, on, on the portal all the information that you have. And, you know, we're going to try and use this downtime in Europe. And what we're doing is we're going to eliminate all the routes in Europe. So when we come back, we intend to build back better. So we hope that the huge delays we had in 2018 and 2019, we think we can engineer them out of the system by eliminating route restrictions, eliminating levels, so that should be much better. And the airlines are working very closely with us to do this. One thing I would say is that decision making is all about data. We're supplying data quite a lot to all of you, and you can sign up to our interactive dashboard. We update our data every single week. For Ireland, I think it's important to look at the effect of the coronavirus. I mean, you know, you had a growth in aviation of 24% from 13 to 90. That's a quarter of an expansion. I witnessed much of it myself. When I started with Ryanair, they had 25 aircraft. When I left, they had 450. This industry with leasing, with MROs, with OEMs, really, really has grown. But you haven't, I would accept, had much support during this pandemic. Really, you know, it's like aviation is not the star child of Ireland anymore, and it's a very big issue. And I think that the French have been a really good example. They have provided significant support to Airbus, but more importantly, they have gone right down the value chain to, su to support people who are supplying rivets, to support MROs, to support small OEMs. They are all been supported by helicopter money from the French state, and not just furlough payments. Furlough payments are okay, but they're, they're, they're a short-term fix, but they don't deal with some of the CapEx issues, the loan issues that you've got. And this year, Ireland's down 57%. And, you know, just to give you an example, you only had 142 flights um, on the 20th of October, a 75% reduction. So I saw a thing that Michael O'Leary put out on the screen there and Sean Doyle of, of Aer Lingus, he was talking about Ireland being a little bit like North Korea. In reality, that's the situation. It's tough. So connectivity is something that I've always prided Ireland to be, and we need to get that back as quickly as possible. I mean, if you look at, for instance, the situation in Ireland, airports, huge reductions, and this is particularly important for small regional airports like Shannon and Cork. Ryanair have ceased their operation there, and I think it'll be only a matter of time before Aer Lingus do the same. And if you look, for instance, at where, where are people operating? I mean, Ryanair and Aer Lingus, you know, Stobart, nobody really saw huge reductions, and that's last week, 13th of October to the 19th of October. So maybe we could just have a look at something. If we have a look at, you know, our regional pairs, seven, by and large, our operations to Europe from Ireland are 74% down. To non-Europe, that's principally North Atlantic operations and Middle East, 75% down. So all that's operating out of Ireland at the moment is a skeleton service, but mainly cargo and business. And that's really it. And, you know, what's interesting is that the United Kingdom is our main market. You know, we've had travel restrictions there all summer, and you've seen the devastating effect that that's had on the, um, on the tourism industry. And, of course, also Germany and the Netherlands as well, essentially. So, essentially, Ireland has been closed 2020. This has not been the case in the continent. And, actually, 
you know, I put, make the point I made previously, the continent's COVID situation, yes, it's serious. I'm in Belgium and it's very serious. But actually, in many places throughout the continent, it's no worse than Ireland. And in many cases, it's a lot better. So you can see, for instance, that, you know, our regional pairs are suffering big, the North Atlantic, uh, et cetera. So just to kind of come towards the end, if you look at the Ryanair operation throughout the summer, you can see what happened. Look, Ryanair can fly from other countries. They can fly from Europe. So in July, just have a look at that red line there. They stepped up their operation and they kept it up during August and it's now coming down again. But here's the thing, and this is what tells the tale for aviation in Ireland. Look at the Aer Lingus operation, just banging along the bottom because the only place they fly is out of Ireland and the North Atlantic. And as we say, Ireland has been closed for business. So for you in your thing, it's important for your connectivity to stay in touch with suppliers as well. Just finally, I want to just mention the environment. You know, the biggest problem with environment is there's great opportunities in aviation focusing on sustainability and the environment. Many of the research programs the Commission are doing, such as CESAR and Horizon programs, all need to have sustainability. So I think that regardless of what industry you're in, you need to start looking at what the green effect is or can I use sustainability to market? We had a situation where traffic in Europe grew by 3% over two years, 19 to 17. If you look at Ireland, emissions were up 11.7%. Irish traffic was up 6%. So you can see by and large CO2 is higher than traffic uh, and by twice. And look at what's happened during the pandemic. CO2 emissions in Ireland, 76% reduction. So CO2 is down, traffic is down, et cetera. So what we're trying to do in Europe is to try and reset the relationship between CO2 and NOx emissions. Normally, the relationship is flight growth multiplied by two equals CO2 growth. We're going to try and half that again. That's when we return and build back better. If it's worth looking there towards the end of looking at Ireland, and if you look at the total traffic out of Ireland, it's higher than our CO2 emissions. And that's, that is really good. And it's important because we don't really have hub and spoke operations out of Ireland. So our opportunity is very good. I'll supply you with a copy of these slides at the end. And here I just want to point something out to you. If you look at number five there, here you see percentage share of traffic and the green percentage share of CO2. So the largest low cost is number five, and the second largest low cost is number seven. So this idea that low cost airlines generate CO2 emissions is actually not true. They generate a share, but actually long haul carriers significantly generate more CO2 than anybody else. So the opportunity for me, guys, is in hydrogen and electrification propulsion. Anything you can do in Ireland to focus in on, you know Airbus have started to market hydrogen, and they're looking at these entering service by 2035. To me, we also have the whole issue of sustainable aviation fuels. And this is important. Remember, SAF fuels are too expensive. They are three times the current cost of J1. It's too expensive, but we need them for long haul flights. The Commission are talking about providing significant um, research incentives, but it's the only way to go. Ireland, I think, needs to look at this option. What's the option of getting SAP? And here's with the Irish government. You now have a green component in the government. You need help. You know, we don't believe in Euro control that taxing aviation does a lot. And I'll finish on that in a moment. But, you know, all throughout Europe, we're looking at inefficient airspace. For instance, if you travel between Dublin and London City, it's an extra 100 kilometers, 25% extra, Zurich to Amsterdam. Barcelona to Frankfurt, all throughout this. So we're faced with inefficiencies. The European Green Deal, where the market opportunity is, deals with this. And just on decarbonisation, we believe, and we're quite proactive in this, we do not believe that taxing aviation reduces emissions. And this runs counter-narrative. And this is different to what most people are saying. Because if you tax aviation, it doesn't really do anything. And we proved this by a paper we published last week. We believe that if you're taxing aviation, you should ring fence the taxes for green projects such as hybridization, sustainable fuels, and of course, um, hydrogen aircraft, et cetera. So have a look at that paper if you get a chance. And then I just want to kind of end on this. Look, before COVID, we believe traffic would grow. Airspace was an issue. Carbon neutral is very important for your industry. Single European sky. 
The only difference is now we have a postponement to 2024. And I believe that Ireland should use that postponement to build capability and sustainability and look at the Green Deal. Because the only way forward for us now is get rid of these stupid quarantines as quickly as we can, adopt the European traffic light system, move to enhanced coordination, look at a green recovery and adopt the single European sky. These are our recommendations to all governments. So thank you very much. What we're doing in Eurocontrol is supporting the recovery, supporting the single European sky and hoping to give you good advice. Now, I'm aware there's a lot of stuff there. We'll supply this information to you and I'm happy for any questions. But just remember, don't get disheartened. This is not something anybody caused. And it's really, really important that Ireland, Ireland as an island actually restores connectivity, moves back to leasing aircraft as quickly as possible, get the technical services back, the research services back as quickly as you can. And if I was to give you advice in the short term, focus on Asia. In the medium term, focus on sustainability and the environment. In the long term, back to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eamon. Very informative, uh, probably a realistic, very realistic view. And here and there also really a wake up call uh, for all of us. So thank you very much for, um, for your presentation and your insights. Uh, there were some questions coming in and, and I could actually summarize them um, around three teams really. Uh, the first theme would be uh, a change in the profile of, of customers, of travelers, uh, your, your views on that. But I I'll, I'll may ask uh, the, the person who asked the question to come in uh, later on that. Uh, also a change in the type of equipment that, that you think will be used in the future. And then finally, obviously, uh, a question that we all have. So how should medium-sized companies like our Enterprise Ireland clients really position in the short term, but obviously also keeping the medium and the long term in, in mind? So I'll start off with the, with the first question on uh, profile of travelers. And maybe I can ask Maurice McLernan to come in uh, if that works. If it doesn't, I'll handle the question myself from, from the question box here. Hello. Yes, Maurice. Can you hear me, Patrick. Hello. Uh, firstly, yes, Evan, thanks. Thank you very much for a very, very good synopsis of the whole situation, and uh, it gives me uh, grow, great hope for the future. Um, I'm just wondering, have have you done any forecasting on what on on the return to normal, what the passenger profile will be? Will there be less business class? Could there be less over 70s flying? Um, could there be more people not flying because of uh, environmental issues. Thank you. Okay, um, Patrick Morris, th thank you for the question. <clears throat> so I, 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 I'm going to be biased here, Maurice. So the research that we have done in, uh, indicates two things. First of all, um, the profile of the customers, we don't believe it will change significantly. And this uh, this one's counter narrative. And, you know, I always remind, um, people when they talk about a crisis of Joe Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's father, who was asked what his business philosophy was, and he said, it's turn into the herd. Don't go with the narrative. This narrative that Zoom calls and all this will reduce business class, we don't buy it. Now, let's be clear. Uh, it will not have some impact, we believe, in the short term, and that's in 2021, 2022, on long haul passengers. We believe there will be more Zoom, so you will see a reduction there of about 20, 25%. But you can't build a business based on Zoom. You can't do it. You can't build a relationship. You can't build anything. You, there's nothing. You can't build a personal relationship built on Zoom. So we don't believe it. So what we actually believe, just to be clear, is that up there will be consolidation of airlines in the european market you will see greater activity by the low costs now just just be really practical Ryanair, for instance have 200 deliveries of 73 maxes coming on in the next two years do you think they're going to not stimulate the market on that easyjet have deli have deliveries but the most important one is whiz whiz have um nearly 200 a321 has been delivered. So I think that the fact that the production will come will be important. Now let's look at, at profiles of, of customers. The older population will resume traveling once they understand you've got a vaccine and it's safe. Because remember, 
the oldest generation, particularly in Ireland and in the UK, they have more money than the young people. They have second homes in Spain. I mean, it's incredible where, where you know the, the difference in the wealth of the baby boomers and the, and the next generation. So I'm confident you will return to a good passenger growth. Now, the factor, they, so I believe that they will return because they've got the cash. The younger people, will they not fly? Now, this is very interesting. The narrative at the moment is that trains in Europe should replace short-haul flights. And by short-haul, we mean those under 300k. The reality is if ATRs, etc., they do not give the same levels of, em of emissions. And actually, you will see a change in that market, I think. But I still think young people will fly. And I go back to the most important thing I say to everybody is what Alexander Gajuniak, the DG of IATA, says, aviation is the business of freedom. And when you put fences up and you stop people traveling, you know, you actually end up having countries that have problems, you know, with autocracies and all of this kind of thing. So believe it or not, I think we will be back to a very good market by 2023. And I think there'll be a little bit of pent up demand. So I'm not buying this kind of green narrative, particularly coming out of some of the um, uh, countries that, um, you know, people shouldn't fly. And I was at the European Parliament last week, Maurice, or two weeks ago, and I made a very important point to Kieran Cuff and others that were there at, at the thing, and it's this, is that the objective of, of the Green Movement, as I understand it, and I, I'm very committed to it, is two things. One, to reduce CO2, and two, to affect, to reduce NOx. And these are the major impacts on the environment. Their objective should not be to kill aviation. We should encourage aviation, and here is where they need to put the taxes into developing sustainable aviation. So that's a bit of a rant, but there you go. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Eamon. And uh, I was glad you used uh, Jack Kennedy as a, a, a as an example. He he came through the prohibition and made made a lot more money afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so moving then to the the question on on more the equipment side, um, Eamon. I saw a question coming in from uh, Sean Long, who actually reacted to your comments about air filtering in, in cabins, but he sees other areas where, where equipment uh, changes may be required. So, Sean, can you come into the call? Okay, it seems there is an issue with, uh, with Sean, unless he's on mute, like it often uh, happens on, on this type of calls. So I'll give it another try, Sean. Okay, not to worry. Uh, I'll read out the question that he submitted here. So I agree in cabin air uh, that air is filtered, but the real issue is common touch areas in cabin and departure launches. And developments are underway on onboarding processes, departure gates, antimicrobial surfaces, and UV lighting. So your thoughts, please, on, on that, Eamon, on, on those areas. Okay, uh, it's it's a very good point Sean, Sean has raised, but I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Um, I wouldn't waste a lot of money on that at the moment. I'll tell you why. We believe that we will have a vaccine announced before Christmas. It will be rolled out worldwide in quarter four of 2021. So, the, you know, I, I, this idea that going forward that people will want to sit with glass screens between them, I, I, we don't believe they will. We believe that um, if normal situation like masks using HEPA filters and good hygiene practices are on the aircraft, I believe that that will be it. The, so, and can I be really honest with you why? Airlines in the short term will say, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, we need, we need this. But in the long run, once we return to any level of normality, they will cut this very quickly if this is the problem. So what I would be urging people to do would be to work on systems, for instance, that actually improve the ventilation systems or the passenger experience or maybe individual equipment for the passengers or, or cleaning surfaces. But I wouldn't be spending huge amounts of capex on that because, and, I, and I've had this discussion with, with both Airbus and Embraer, they don't believe that that in the long run will be the point. Maybe if I could just go to a broader question about equipment um, to just follow on Sean's one. I, I think it's important that we realize that, particularly for MROs, the ability to work on composite aircraft on the new generation engines is really, really important. And I think that this is, is important. GE, for instance, are launching a whole series of new engines. And this is a generation past the NEO. 
So you've got to get to this sustainable green spot in the engine. So to me, that's a big issue. And you're going to be faced with, you know, the 737s and the 8320s are still going to be the workhorses for the next 10 years. But um, after that, I think you'll see a big change. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, moving to the, the question on, on how to position as, as a medium-sized company or, or a player in, in the market, uh, I think Paul McDermott uh, wanted to ask um, how best should Aerowind position uh, in the current times in a changing marketplace. So I might ask Paul to just briefly uh, describe the current situation. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Paul. Hi. Yeah, uh, we're an electric motor repair company, and um, we're just curious as to how best to position ourselves, mainly in the French market we were looking at. But um, I appreciate what you're saying about Asia. I think it's probably best that we will concentrate there at the moment. But I just don't see it as an MRO. Uh, the future doesn't look too healthy at the moment. So it's just the best position is, is, is really my question. Okay, thank you. Any any views, uh, Eamon? Um, now, that's a really difficult question. And in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous question because MROs are in a meltdown at the moment. I mean, you, I, I explained why, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. Airlines are not flying. So MROs are getting sh sh shook down. So what I would say is in the short term, the only thing that you can really do is basically look at trying to see what you can do to provide kind of advanced maintenance, basically on the basis of maybe sell products that, you know, would be advanced maintenance. But this is really difficult because they don't want to do cash. So I would just come back to you to say that you're in the French market. The French market at the moment is, is nearly dead. You know, Airbus have kind of grinded, uh, you know, it's, it's grounded to a halt because of the fact that the production sh showback, Air France are not flying, EasyJet operations have nearly stopped. So. I think it'll pick up reasonably quickly for MRO activity after next Easter if we get back to some kind of a reasonable level of activity. So my only advice to you is two things. Try survive the winter and preserve cash. Try diversify away from France and try and get to next summer. I do believe if you get to next summer, things will be better. And I'll tell you why. Because we will have vaccine announcements before Christmas. That by itself will give people confidence when they start to put vaccine. If you look at the news in Ireland at the moment, and I'm not in on it every day because I, I'm based in Brussels, but when I just flick into it, it's unusual in that it seems to be a very negative uh, uh, atmosphere there. But it's not so bad on the continent. And what I would say is that people will return to traveling very quickly and aircraft will need cycle um, MRO shop stuff very very quickly there but all you can do in the short term is try and contact them and see can you do stuff off season that's about all you can do because remember in normal times and i know this is hard to say mro activity increases particularly in the winter that's when a lot of the checks are done so if you can sell that concept you know and maybe talk to your bank and see if it's possible that you could help the airlines a little bit but you know you're taking a risk here with some of the airlines at the moment thank you thank you amen uh, continuing on, on this topic, uh, there was a question from Patrick uh, Edmonds um, about decarbonization. So maybe, Patrick, you can come in. Um, hi there, Eamon. Um, hope all's well with you. Um, I appreciated the comments about uh, decarbonization. That's really interesting because some of the work I'm doing at the moment is on a, a SAF production facility business plan. Um, We'll chat about that again sometime. But do you see decarbonization, given what you said, as, as giving a push to make Cesar a, a, a reality or to accelerate the single sky? Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. Um, good to hear from you. So uh, the decarbonization, so just from Brussels, you, you will get nothing for research from Brussels, from Cesar, from Horizon, from INEA, from anything, unless you put the word sustainability in it. It's the most important thing. So the Green Deal is really important. Uh, Timmermans, the, the, the um, VP of the Commission, has put this stamp on everything. So from network, from ATC, from new aircraft. So it's really important that everything you do in aviation, 
you look at the word sustainability, environmental effectiveness, and look at can you produce things that are lighter? Can you produce things that are greener? Can you dispose of things quicker? And what I would say for most small businesses is that they should use the downtime, go into a room and say, okay, put five people together. How can we put things make things greener how can we make things lighter you know other countries have a good reputation for a green deal such as sweden but actually ireland has the most intrinsic way of doing this because we have a larger aviation industry even though it's a little forgotten at the moment i think so patrick all of the cesar projects will have a green component absolutely every single one of them that's great Eamon. thanks a million thank you uh question from uh, my colleague john mcgill uh, asking when will airlines, airlines start to adopt new software technologies? Most operate outdated legacy systems that have large manual inputs, scheduling, uh, which keep costs up. Any views on that, uh, Eamon? That's a, that's a really good question from John. I mean, let, uh, uh, let's just explore the, the, the problem at the moment. So the problem with the aircraft technology is actually the problem with the ground technology. And, and here's what it is. The current generation of aircraft's technology is a generation ahead of the ground. So by and large, aircraft are equipped with avionics that are far superior. And actually, in many cases, the ground technology can't simply cope with them. So when you're looking at, for instance, things like electronic flight bags and all of this kind of thing, but also looking at new software systems on, on board, I think that you will see a generational change come 2025 because you will see a huge change in the ground facilities in Europe. And maybe I'll be specific. We're looking at looking at satellite tracking systems for um, surveillance. We're actually looking at satellite communication systems um, as well. We're looking at a reduction in ground aids, but also giving the uh, aircraft a lot more information based on trajectory rather than just traditional flight plans. So new software generation will really be needed in terms of data linking facilities from about 2025. So I think you're still two or three years away from it, John. But keep going because, you know, as the new 7.3 Maxes roll out and the H320 Neos, a lot of this stuff is starting to be there. And actually, one thing I was very pleased to see from Airbus during the week was they have got the ability to upgrade software in a much shorter cycle than before. They were showing us this. So, you know, I think it's helpful. But my answer to you is 2025. Thanks for that. Thank you, Eamon. Um, question, last question on, uh, call it diversification, from Honorary Consul Mr. McGreevy in Toulouse. He's actually wondering whether we can pivot into other transport means. Maybe, uh, Kevin McGreevy, can you briefly come in? Okay, that doesn't seem to work. But um, so the, the question is, um, trams in Toulouse were designed by Airbus. Do companies need to think of themselves as manufacturers of transport in wider sense rather than just airplane builders? Any comments on that, uh, Eamon? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a very philosophical question. I mean, the answer is if you can do it, anything you can do to diversify is good. I mean, Toulouse is a, is a really good example of, a, of an area that's a center of, of excellence for manufacturing. Everything is done in Toulouse from, you know, engines, nacelles, everything there. It's, it's more difficult, I think, in Ireland uh, to do that because you don't have the manufacturing um, base. But, you know, there are, uh, what I would say to you at the moment is look at opportunities. I mean, some of the opportunities, you know, recycling aircraft parts, all of these type of things, it is possible. But again, look at the Green Deal, because really this is the way forward, green. And uh, it is the reality. The EU are producing huge funds in greens. And Patrick Edmund made a point there about Cesar. They have a lot of cash available for green projects. And you should be looking at everything that can be done under the basis of EMEA, Horizon, or, or, or Cesar. OK, thank you. We are approaching the end of this session, but I do want to tackle the two remaining questions that are out there. They're of a similar nature, uh, Eamon. They're about the role that Eurocontrol can play uh, to lobby uh, the governments to adapt the traffic light system on the one hand. And the second question is, you have your finger on the pulse of the European Commission. Do you think that the Commission will initiate assistance to the manufacturing sector of the aviation market? So those are questions more of a, of a policy, political nature. Uh, your views on that? Yeah, okay. So first of all, I'll take the second one first. So 
the Commission, I think, will help, but they will only help through the existing methodologies. I mean, let's be clear. All of the assistance in France has been given by the French government. All of the assistance in Germany by the German government, by the Italian government. I mean, the Irish government have done nothing to help aviation except the furlough system. The reality is in the others, they have supported the manufacturings, they have supported everything. So they have put much more cash into it. So there's no Europe-wide scheme that helps aviation as such. What there is, however, I think, and this is available to governments, is availability of finance from the European Central Bank you know, sometimes at even negative interest rates. So there is availability there for national schemes. And I think it's something you could lobby for in Ireland um, through IBEC to put some kind of a scheme together to help manufacturing industries, to help innovation. The funds are there from Europe if they're approached that way. But there's no broad kind of specific aviation one at the moment other than the research programs. And ASD, which is the um, European Organization of Manufacturers you know, in Aerospace, they're lobbying for this at the moment. I was on a call with Jan Pai yesterday, and he was pushing for this. In terms of Europe Controls Road for lobbying, we do it every day. You know, we lobby for the green. I mean, my, my, my role really is to try and get Europe flying. Now, I'm aware of the pandemic, but I don't buy the logic that actually traveling is a very considerable issue here. If you look at the transmission rates, they tend to be community, etc and um but it's a hard message because people you know are pushing a ball up the hill all the time so i'm consistent in trying to be an advocate for it we go to the parliament the commission is helpful but the reality is is that you know the health ministries all throughout europe have kind of captured the politicians and it's a very difficult time for politicians because they're caught between a rock and a hard place if they take the medical advice they close down the economy if they don't take the medical advice uh, they're accused of, um, you know, not looking after the health of the people. So it is difficult. I wouldn't like to be a politician and my sympathies to the Irish government. But, you know, you've gone on this six week lockdown and I just hope that it works. And uh, please God, it will. But if it doesn't, um, you know, my view is personally that you should have a progress of living with the virus and try and do the very best you can. But let's see how it works out. Hopefully we get a vaccine by Christmas announcement. Okay. That sounds like a very good closing remark. Thank you, Eamon. Um, thank you very much to the audience um, of this session, also for your, your good interaction. But a big thanks to, to Eamon Brennan and his team, who's, who's been very available to us uh, to, to, to share his views on, on what the future of the aviation industry is. I thank you very much, and I wish you a pleasant day. Bye now. <laughs>